So good afternoon. We are almost in the final act of this workshop. Um, we discussed a lot about the roadmap. Uh, over the last four or five hours, we have heard too many interesting ideas uh, and thoughts. Uh, roadmaps, roadmaps, I think, are fantastic tools. Uh, they give direction, they create a lot of discussion, but they need implementation. If not, they are daydreams. And this is what this panel is about, to discuss the implementation of this roadmap. So uh, we are not going, of course, to resolve all the issues. We are not going to implement it today. But I think through the very nice panel we have here uh, for you here, uh, we are going to get some very interesting first ideas of how this roadmap really can be implemented, who is doing what, and uh, maybe have some good ideas of what the future will be of this roadmap. So I think we can start straight away. I would like to keep this, um, let's say, more dynamic. I know it's the last part of the day, and we had a very good uh, lunch, <laughs> as someone said before. So I will give uh, f three to five minutes to each of, uh, of the panelists here to give their initial thoughts and their initial ideas, or whatever else they want to say about the, the roadmap and its implementation. And then I will open the floor to the audience, because I think it's important to get also the feedback from your side, and then have a kind of, a, I don't like to call it Q&A, but a kind of an interaction with you. And then a final round of thoughts, if time permits, so our uh, distinguished panelists here can conclude. So I will start with uh, the first uh, person here, so Andrea Tilge, who is the head of unit from the European Com in the European Commission dealing with climate action and earth observation. So Andrea, you have the floor. <coughs> Thank you, Tassos. Uh, and um, I would like to start with uh, page 13 of the roadmap, referring to that, where we have put uh, a, a, a scheme uh, that come from uh, the discussion of the last year workshop, uh, it's a conceptual scheme of which are the actors uh, in uh, Europe and worldwide, uh, um, even if uh, worldwide is not very much detailed, but uh, there are uh, indications of the various actors. And uh, in the text, uh, in the same page, uh, we um, clarify that uh, this uh, is uh, for the future to be used as a framework because we can implement this roadmap through various means. And we have, uh, mm, this roadmap is called a, a research and innovation roadmap, which uh, uh, so contains two, com two components. Uh, one is uh, research, uh, which is more a supply side mode, uh, and the other is innovation, which is uh, something different, which is more uh, how to make uh, the market being built and being uh, uh, supported and uh, uh, define and develop new products. But we, we mentioned that we have today several kind of instruments. Horizon 2020 is one. Copernicus is another important program. There are actions promoted. There are the joint programming initiatives. And uh, here Patrick is sitting here with, with us. But this is the joint programming initiative on climate. But there are others dealing with, the, uh, with si uh, similar issues, water, agriculture, and, and so on. There are actions which are promoted uh, nationally, and, uh, um, and there are uh, international cooperation activities that can be, can be carried out with partners uh, beyond the EU. There are actions funded by other European bodies, like uh, the European Space Agency. Unfortunately, Mark Doherty could not be with us uh, today, and uh, <clears throat> and by and actions promoted and supported directly by the private sector, and we have uh, uh, good examples. For instance, uh, through the EIT of uh, possible joint ventures between uh, European funded activities and private sector activities. <clears throat> I'm. I can uh, offer you a snapshot of what uh, uh, Horizon 2020, the European Commission, is proposing in order to implement this roadmap. Uh, this roadmap is the output of an expert group, it's not something that we have uh, uh, endorsed officially, but definitely we have worked 
very closely with uh, the expert group in order, and this represents a lot of our ideas. And we think that we have already started this uh, implementation because uh, our history of uh, supporting research in this field and, uh, is, is not uh, new. Um, we have uh, a series of past projects that have tried to launch the concept of climate services that uh, have already completed their, their course. We have a group of projects related to seasonal to decadal forecasting, which are still very active and uh, producing extremely good science. Um, we have uh, launched recently a new generation of projects in relation to the, Earth's, the new generation of Earth system models. And uh, uh, last year, we uh, launched as well a, a, a very important activity in our view on uh, how to develop uh, modeling capabilities for the water cycle, which is still today one of the most difficult uh, areas to address uh, in terms of predictions. <clears throat> then, uh, in the recent call for proposals uh, that are still uh, open and uh, which uh, will uh, soon receive uh, projects, uh, there is a, uh, an area that is a collaboration with the JPI, where there is a huge uh, error net, but on this, uh, Patrick will talk about that, where we have uh, overall an investment of 75 million euros in the field of climate services. And then uh, uh, this year, we expect, and, uh, and uh, Roger has uh, pointed out that building the community is uh, one key issue of the roadmap, but we have already launched a coordination action on climate services and modeling that may be extremely useful for supporting this kind of activity. Uh, and, uh, um, and on top of that, we have uh, already uh, ongoing um, activities in the field of adaptation that may contribute. What is next? We are working now on the 2016-17 um, uh, work program, and uh, we have already presented to the member states our first thoughts. Um, of course, they are not secret, because when we put this to the member states, they become available to everybody. And uh, so I don't uh, discover, disclose any secret to say that uh, we are thinking already of uh, uh, looking, and st I look at Stephen uh, in particular, at the regional modeling issues, and we are using exactly more or less the same kind of words that you have used, uh, calling it modeling and climate projection system for Europe, that uh, uh, I, I got from the many interventions of today as one of the key areas where uh, in, uh, uh, in high, well, um, specialized and specific information is needed uh, in order to be capable of translating uh, uh, information to end users which have specific needs in specific locations. But then we are uh, going to propose uh, some key aspects of market research in order to support the growth of this uh, uh, climate service market. They, uh, we launched the call for ideas during the uh, final stage of the roadmap, uh, when we were working on the roadmap, uh, this idea came, came out and we immediately implemented. And this is already closed. Uh, this call for ideas, we received about 60 different ideas from of uh, ready to uh, go uh, uh, activities, uh, demonstration activities on climate services. We have to say that the majority of them were not really ready. Uh, there are probably very few uh, among those that we have received that are ready to go, but uh, uh, the demonstration of, uh, uh, of climate service activities will be in the next framework program as the starting point, and we will uh, propose as well actions for the co-design and co-development of what are future climate services in areas that are not yet mature enough for uh, deploying this uh, in full scale. Um, and then we will continue working with the joint programming initiative uh, for which we will have, an, uh, we establish a, a stable partnership all through 
uh, Horizon 2020. But on, on top of that, uh, we will promote as well uh, scientific activity on uh, the Arctic uh, in order to see how the Arctic changes are impacting on the changes in weather and climate in the northern hemisphere, which is affecting the predictability of, uh, uh, of climate uh, very much. And uh, uh, last but not least, and probably not yet uh, clear to the, because it's a new thing that we are discussing these days, is to look at uh, the, uh, as uh, Jos Del Becke pointed out, and the monitoring uh, and the MRV section as well, um, aspects as well, uh, that uh, may become an important uh, tool as well for climate science. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. And let me pass now to Hugo Juncker. He's a colleague from the European Commission, so one of us, and dealing with uh, Copernicus. So, Hugo, the floor is yours. Okay, so thank you. Um, so just uh, to be completely correct, so my name is Zunke, not Juncker, so I'm not, not affiliated <laughs> <laughs> with our president. Um, so, um, and I'm from the General Directorate Growth, uh, which is indeed in um, charge of running the Copernicus program. And so I would like maybe to complement what Andrea said with a, with a couple of elements uh, from, from uh, our perspective. So. Of course, um, these um, RTD on climate and Copernicus are really very nicely uh, complementary elements uh, to, to achieve a maximum maximum impact and synergy on in this area. So, um, for sure, both are useful to to uh, foster and develop um, the climate services. Um, but they have their specific role. So the Copernicus Climate Change Service, as we have heard before from Alan, uh, and it was mentioned as well, is not going to the full depth, I would say, of detail towards the final end user. So, so for a number of reasons, which I don't uh, elaborate now here in detail. Um, so this last part, so the last mile to go to the to the indi individual users is left to um, uh, what we call downstream service providers. But it is clear that this last part is absolutely essential in achieving anything with this uh, Copernicus program because uh, without this link between the Copernicus service and the end users, uh, the whole machinery won't work and won't deliver an anything. So this is very important to, to uh, understand that this sector needs to develop and flourish as well, uh, in particular. So the RTD program here uh, is needed to feed into really all parts of this value chain equally, otherwise uh, all this picture cannot, cannot work together. So that's a bit maybe about the context from our side. Um, so for, on the Copernicus program itself, it's uh, really an operational program, has been decided upon in uh, 2014, so last year. And uh, maybe it's nice to see that the legal base for this program explicitly mentions climate change, so uh, to, that the program is to support adaptation and mitigation policies. It goes even into mentioning ECVs, climate analysis, projections, lots of technical detail here. So this means that climate change is considered really a very important issue that it's really put into the DNA of the, of the whole program. Uh, the overall size of the program is 4.3 billion, including the satellites, so still a considerable portion of this uh, is, is associated with the climate change services, about uh, 200 million for the whole uh, period. And uh, it was mentioned this morning that, of course, we don't do all this investment and in 2020 we drop, drop everything and uh, undertake something different. So. You can see from these figures that, of course, we, we can expect that there will be a sustained framework for these services uh, beyond 2020, even if there is no firm, uh, legally firm commitment possible at this stage. Um, so what are the, for us the characteristics of an operational program beyond the sustainability? So um, 
for sure there is a strong commitment for these services on the timely availability, meaning it's they are supposed to be available 365 days a year, seven days a week, and 24 hours a, uh, a day. So in particular, Alan here. Um, there is a strong element, as Alan pointed out, on quality control and validation, which is essential to, in order to gain and earn trust over the time and to be really uh, reliable. And more and more was mentioned as well this morning, partly, there is, people are interested in understanding what is the residual uncertainty uh, of the information they are giving. So, um, how... Uh, how reliable is this? What is this still the error bar in, in this, this part? So clearly the service, Copernicus Climate Service, has the ambition to become the trusted source for climate information and uh, by this found a sound foundation for development of all these climate services we have been discussing in the morning, the, 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 all these uh, particular sectoral applications and so on and so on. Um, what about the evolution of Copernicus? Because this is, of course, as well linked very much to this uh, roadmap. So um, the evolution is essential for the service to maintain its position at the leading edge of, of the uh, state of the art and to contribute, as I said already, to the prospering of the downstream sector. So how is the Copernicus service driven? It's driven, of course, by member states' poli policy needs. They are paying for this at the end. Um, there is continuously a monitoring of user needs uh, and user satisfaction. So from this, we take, we take um, possible improvements and evolution of the services. Some, some of these, so smaller parts, can more or less be integrated directly in the operational services on the, on the fly, more or less. Um, others may need some specific uh, research elements to be procured by the service in order to have uh, a, a specific co new components developed or so. But there are, of course, a wealth of, of uh, possible evolutions which cannot be uh, procured within or pursued within the operational service. And here we will, of course, need to rely on Horizon 2020 to deliver research results which are then, in a, at a later stage, going uh, eventually or possibly uh, taken up by the, by the services. So this is, uh, I think, quite, quite important to understand that there are different levels of evolution and there are different tools at our hands to, to, so to solve this. Um, I had already underlined the downstream part. Um, I would here maybe like to mention as well that um, because often the research projects are perceived as being too slow, too, 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 too large sometimes to, to achieve a specific, very well targeted needs. So there are other tools in the Horizon 2020. There is a specific line for SME activities, um, which um, can go a bit faster and uh, more flexible. And as well, there are specific tools for access to risk finance. So we have mentioned this morning that uh, sometimes uh, climate-related act activities are perceived as particularly risky by banks, so there are issues with this. So that's something else I want, would like to highlight here. I think to make a to summary, uh, to sum, sum this up from our point, at the end, all these elements are supposed to play together to um, provide us with the tools which our societies will need to meet the policy obje objectives in, in the area of climate. So that's the ultimate uh, goal and objective. And secondly, of course, uh, we would like to, to grow this sector and to contribute to the economic uh, uh, recovery and create jobs and growth and all this. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Hugo, and I give the floor immediately to Patrick, Patrick Monfrey from the JPI, so to hear the perspectives of the JPI climate. Thank you. Um, the JPI climate, it's a joint programming initiative between the uh, member states. Actually, there is uh, 16 countries associated with these uh, uh, initiatives that cross Europe. We are uh, trying to also to attract more eastern countries and southern countries to cover uh, the full uh, member state of EU. Uh, so joint programming basically uh, is based on national uh, research actors. So it's a research ministry, environment ministry, uh, research funding organization, and also very important research performing organization 
from the public sectors, including academia. So basically, the GPI, uh, and in that case, uh, for the climate research, is uh, rooted on the uh, uh, national uh, institution, institution and organization. Uh, there is, uh, this GPI have been organized in 2012 uh, around four modules, uh, one toward uh, decadal uh, climate predictability, uh, the second on research for climate services, I will back on that, uh, the third on sustainable transformation of society to face climate change, and the fourth uh, tools for decision making. So all is about research, but research in a very large sense. So it's not only uh, about climatology, it's any field of research of disciplines from uh, economic science to social sciences and humanities, including life science and also earth and climate sciences. So it's really mobilizing uh, 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 in multidisciplinary ways the disciplines in our different countries in EU, but also to make uh, uh, synergies between them, between the researchers uh, with transnational call, for example, but also making um, synergy between the funders, between the, uh, between the institution and the performing organization with better co-alignment of our national program, of our national strategy to forge some common vision. So uh, the GPI Climate since 2012 has launched uh, um, a set of fast track activities. I have no time to, uh, to uh, present here. Uh, we have launched a call on the sustainable transformation to face climate change and uh, to mobilize social sciences and humanities across Europe in 2013. Uh, in uh, this year, in April 1st, we will launch a call on the climate predictability and interregional linkage that will be an initiative that is shared both by GPI Climate European, but also internationally with the Belmont Forum, attracting G7 countries and BRICS countries as Brazil, India, or China. Um, for next year, we are planning, as uh, Andrea mentioned, to launch uh, a large initiative uh, uh, within an era net, so that means it's associated to the member state uh, and, uh, and the funders at the member state level, but also uh, the European Commission uh, uh, to, uh, to launch a large initiative on research for climate services. Uh, we are targeting 75 million euros uh, potential of mobilization <coughs> uh, with uh, two complementary aspects. One, of them will be supported by research funding organization that will be target uh, to mobilize largely the academics, uh, including social sciences and humanities, but up to the field actors. So a main uh, target, in fact, is to support co-development for user needs and action-oriented projects. So it's calling for multidisciplinary and transdisciplinary. Uh, the instrument will be uh, complementary to uh, what Commission is supporting. So it's, uh, the size is to small size, I would say uh, half million euros to five million euros uh, project. Um, the second thing, uh, and I think it's more uh, innovate, an innovation in terms of, uh, of, uh, of uh, joint programming and also in association with the Commission, is to have another topics that mobilize the research performing organization. And the focus is to institu institutional integration of research component of national climate services. It's very different from one country to another country. Some country uh, national climate services is yet organized and, uh, is, and centralized. In some other countries, it's very uh, fragmented. Uh, and uh, sometimes so it's uh, strongly linked with, with a uh, services also, and what is proposed here is to support institutional integration across Europe between these different initiatives, in particular to develop common tools, common methodologies, but also to propagate climate scenarios, viability and uncertainties within the different models from, uh, I would say, the global scenario to regional uh, scenarios, but up to the different impact or sectorial uh, uh, impact modeling. So this big problem need to be 
tackle at European level and we want to put synergy between the institution and, uh, and performing organization. Uh, this uh, actually, uh, we have more than 30 uh, performing organizations that have shown their interest to participate in this, uh, 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 in this with in-kind support uh, and the potential uh, added top-up money from commission. So um, we are uh, in a very active phase because uh, the proposal needs to be submitted to commission for the top-up for 21st of April. And, uh, but I think it's this kind of tool that, that both mobilize the different type of institution at national level, plus the commission, I think it's a, a way to have a uh, way to more integrate and a better coordination. I would just uh, mention that, that we have, uh, in fact, we are yet implementing the roadmaps that have been uh, issued this morning. Uh, I would say that uh, we, uh, I've yet used a draft of, the, of this roadmap and uh, we particularly target for uh, the, the support uh, from the funding agency. We're particularly targeting assessing the nature of climate services market. I'm referring to the table on page six. Uh, demonstrating the added value of climate services market and a lot of emphasis also on standard quality control, quality assessment, uh, open access and also legal aspect associated with climate services. So it's something that we want to particularly highlight. From the perform performing organization side, we want, uh, of course, uh, growing the climate services market associated with that uh, and mobilize the infrastructures associated with. Last but not least, I want to say that uh, we want also uh, beyond the connection with uh, um, the Commission and, and the Member State, we want also to have a stronger uh, interaction with uh, other initiatives that are also led by Member State as Copernicus and uh, also uh, Key Climate. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick, uh, for this overview. We we'll go directly to Daniel, Daniel Zimmer from the Climate Kick. So a lot of innovation there and <laughs> being a director, so we're Really looking forward to hear. It's on? Okay, thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Daniel Zimmer, the Director of Innovation at Climate Kick, and um, I want to briefly introduce you what Climate Kick is and what we are doing, and also um, draw a number of lessons from programs and activities that we have initiated in the past years. So what is Climate Kick? It's a kick, so it's a knowledge and innovation community that is a sort of large partnership, pan-European partnership that uh, involves uh, academia, so researchers, but also um, uh, professors and, um, uh, in universities, uh, companies of all sites, of all sizes, excuse me, uh, small uh, number of startups, uh, SMEs, uh, but also large corporates, but also public authorities, cities, regions of Europe who take part in, a, in an ecosystem where we try to connect users, suppliers of uh, climate information in a number of areas that are climate, directly climate related, so such as uh, greenhouse gas measurements, for instance, but also uh, city uh, adaptation uh, or bioeconomy. So we are dealing with a, a large range of issues with the objective to create innovative tools and services to address climate change, adaptation and mitigation. But also we are supporting startups and uh, to create and to uh, to uh, accelerate them so that they uh, reach the market and, uh, and, and grow to, to, to have an impact more quickly. And we are also developing education, an education program to educate the innovators that are needed to, um, to address climate change issues. One important issue is that we want to be measured against the impact that we generate. So we are, and the impact is not only a number of startups, etc., but it's actual 
uh, greenhouse gas mitigations, actual uh, increase in uh, resilience. So this is uh, very much the way we, we, we want to work. And for this, uh, we are very much looking at developing value chains. So starting from the climate information, but going down the value chain, down to uh, actual adaptation, for instance, and, uh, and measures that uh, create increased resilience. So what is probably one of the areas uh, of climate kick that is close to what we are discussing today is what we call our adaptation service platform, which has been actually involved and we have representatives here in the room of this of that platform and it's a platform that is called adaptation services meaning that we really want to start from climate information and go down to uh, working with uh, users working with different economic sectors and uh, develop uh, tools to uh, to support the adaptation to climate change um, what um, what we have tried to do so far, we have I, I would say there are two types of things that uh, an innovative product that we have uh, tried to create. One is to to uh, generate services for different sectors. Uh, we have, for instance, a program for energy, for the energy sector, where we take climate information and work with the energy sector to identify indicators of vulnerability in different uh, regions, in different parts of the energy value chain, and, and, and develop a service uh, for the energy sector to uh, look at the production issues, to the distribution issues, and even look at the consumption also and, and, and anticipate the changes related to climate change. Another one, another example of such a platform is uh, in Germany. Um, we, we try to, to, uh, to work with the agricultural, the health, the tourist sector and develop again a number of projections of the impacts that climate uh, change could have on these sectors in Germany and then worked with uh, first on with an online platform to deliver this information and from this create a startup that is delivering services uh, to the German uh, actors. We have a similar one, I won't go into details, on, on water globally uh, related to uh, uh, water scarcity issues especially and uh, the needs to invest uh, more in uh, in uh, in infrastructure in order to uh, to cope with uh, uh, increasing water scarcity. So what we have learned from from this initial type of activity is that uh, uh, from the need to the market, the slope is rather steep. It's not easy to get uh, to get traction and to uh, uh, to work with the demand side. And we have, I would say that there are two reasons for this. First is that the level of assessment of the impacts and of the cascading impacts of climate change is at the moment not enough to provide the, the quality of the services that are needed for, for, this, for, this, for many sectors. In agriculture, one example, in France, in the past two decades, the yields uh, of the major cereals have been stagnating. There has been no progress as it was in the past. But when you look at the details of the reasons for this, it's not that the, the, the climate is becoming hotter. No, it's just that in some regions, the rainfall pattern in spring has changed a bit. In other regions, is the harvesting period that has changed a bit. In other regions, is the variety, the, the crop varieties that prove to be not any more fit to the uh, to the new climate. And in fact, all these small changes result in this overall impact. But at the moment, if you don't look at what is happening, it's very difficult to to provide a support uh, to the uh, to the agricultural sector without knowing in detail what the impacts are. And so this uh, comes to, uh, to two conclusions. First, we need to, to, to understand this in greater detail, but also we need us to, to convince people that climate change is not tomorrow, it's today. And there are already a lot of things happening and we can understand uh, where uh, the, these 
Im little impacts are already visible and in the mind of the decision makers, it is very important that climate change should not be perceived as oh, something for the future in the coming decades. No, climate change needs to be tackled today. Quickly, the second part we have heard of it is working with the insurance sector. You have heard the presentation of the Kiwi Taker uh, before, and we feel that insurance is, an, is really an area where we can have traction now. Uh, and, and in the value chain, in the adaptation value chain, uh, insurance and what we have been doing with uh, supporting Oasis is really pivotal to changing the, the landscape because the insurance sector provides basically the information of the, 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 the value or the, uh, the, the, the costs associated with climate change, but these are the costs of inaction. And that is very important. You get at least from a decision maker an idea of your, the cost of inaction. And this is of course very important, but it's not everything. Because when you know the cost of inaction, you may or not wish, want to take action. And so for this, you need to plug in uh, other activities which look at, okay, what are the different options now to act? And what is the cost of action? And if we can connect the cost of action with the cost of inaction, then we give to the decision makers a very important and useful tool to act. So this is, um, I think, so quickly a lesson that I would like to bring to this uh, round table. Finally, quickly, three, my, three con my conclusions and, and advice for the implementation of the roadmap are threefold. First of all, to, cr the, to create market so we need to, of course, work very much more with the demand side and un understand precisely what the impacts of climate change are. And there needs to be more knowledge brought into this. And, and looking at what is happening today has a very a lot of merit because it shows to decision makers that climate change is already now, but also it gives them more information of where they need to act. The second... Um, uh, the second aspect is very cle cle clearly that we need to document the impacts in a much uh, is a, in a much better way. And the third conclusion is that yeah, we need to find ways to uh, look at the uh, the costs of inaction and to combine them with the cost of action. And these are areas where Climate Kick will be happy to work in combination with other organizations in Europe in the coming years. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for all these ideas. And now we go really global. We go to Felipe Lucio from WMO. He's the head of the GFCS, the Global Framework on Climate Changes. So, Felipe, the, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, good afternoon. <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, my voice is uh, a bit lost. My name is Felipe Lucio, and I'm the director of the Global Framework for Climate Services, which is hosted by the World Meteorological Organization in Geneva. The first thing I'd like to highlight to you is the fact that what started in 2009 at the Third World Climate Conference as an idea, as a vision, the establishment of the Global Framework for Climate Services has become something now operational. The framework is operational. When we started off, we had identified 70 countries around the world who needed support in order to effectively produce and apply climate services. Um, we had a number of international advisors comprised of scientists but also political leaders who designed the framework and identified five priorities. Priorities whose implementation would require putting in place what we call the pillars. And I'm underlining the fact that we need to have those pillars in place so that we have all the conditions to effectively produce and also apply climate services. I'll briefly mention them. The first is the user interface platform. And the roadmap which was developed uh, clearly indicates, clearly uh, underlines the fact that key to the development, key to the growth of a market 
is a better understanding of user needs, is a better understanding of capabilities, but also engaging the various stakeholders that need to be involved in the process of uh, core production, core design, and eventually uh, implementation and evaluation of climate services. That was effectively uh, uh, acknowledged and recognized within the global framework for climate services. So that the user interface platform becomes then the element that informs all the activities which are needed to enable climate services. And those were associated with the subsequent pillars, particularly the observation and monitoring, so that we do not have observations for the sake of observation, but we have observations that respond to specific uh, user needs. Of course, uh, when we talk about observation, we go beyond the physical observations we are very used to and uh, familiar with within the climate community, but we're also talking about the social and economic um, uh, observation and data that was mentioned here. We need an operational system, and that is part of uh, what Copernicus is doing, uh, providing climate services in an operational manner. For that to happen, we need the infrastructure to operationally uh, produce those services. We need to have uh, effective research to support uh, both the needs of uh, uh, the users, but also uh, research to enable better transition between the scientific knowledge into application, into decision-making tools, which are also clearly indicated in the uh, document. And finally, in those 70 countries, one key element which is really needed is the capacity development. Capacity development of institutions, capacity development of individuals, but very often, and I'll talk to that uh, much later, what we do not have are the legal frameworks that support effective implementation of climate services. I'll give you an example. In a certain country, a service is called weather service. So when the weather service started claiming the mandate for climate uh, services, universities and other centers said, wait a minute, your title says something weather service. How can you claim a, a, a mandate for, 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 for climate service? So there are all those aspects which need to be put in place in order to enable uh, uh, effective implementation of climate services. Because we cannot address 70 countries at once, we've uh, decided to focus on a set of countries to develop a proof of concept which will enable us to identify uh, good practices to evaluate the effectiveness of uh, climate services, but also uh, evaluate the added value of those climate services as they support different decision-making uh, uh, processes. And we have currently a number of projects, um, uh, concrete projects, taking place in a number of countries. I'll mention two, uh, Malawi and Tanzania, where we are trying to develop uh, an end-to-end -end, uh, system for the production and application of climate services. But in the process of um, implementing the, the specific activities, we were confronted uh, with a major, major challenge. It wasn't mentioned uh, during the day today, but that challenge is the challenge of coordination. We took as an example 16 countries and uh, we assessed the level of activities that support climate services for an work a workshop we conducted in September on the implementation coordination of the global framework for climate services. And we discovered that in those only 16 countries, we had investments of more than $700 million being today invested in different uh, project and activities. But what was surprising was the fact that uh, those, in, in some of those 16 countries, two or three agencies were investing resources without talking to each other. One agency did not know what the other agency was doing, or if they did, they never coordinated so that they had a, a process or a system which would enable adding on value on the different activities being implemented. So as we move on to implementing uh, the, road, uh, the roadmap, um, key elements which um, have to be um, uh, taken into account is one, how do we make sure that uh, we have a system which captures the different investments being uh, made uh, by different actors? How do we take into account the plans of different actors? And how do we integrate those plans? Uh, we would be interested under the Global Framework for Climate Services to work with uh, the Commission at regional and national level to make sure that uh, the activities we are carrying out support uh, the Commission's activities, but vice versa, Commission's activities also complement the initiatives we, we have. The second, and I've heard here um, 
something mentioned about it, was the issue of um, case studies or good practices being shared. One thing we have to recognize is different uh, um, countries, different agencies, different companies, individuals have different levels or abilities to apply climate information and, and uh, services. And therefore, uh, sharing good practices is a, a major challenge because may not be uh, immediately transferable to another environment. So rather than good practices, perhaps good principles which can enable people to take uh, the things that are valuable should be something that um, need to be considered. Um, in facilitating good practices sharing, but also good collaboration, one key um, action we've been implementing is facilitating the establishment of frameworks for climate services at national level. Here in Europe, we have uh, in the room, the UK um, has its own uh, uh, climate services framework. Germany has its own framework. Uh, Switzerland has a framework. But many other countries are organizing themselves so that they have the dialogue, the, the platform that brings together all the stakeholders that need to address the five components I was talking about earlier in a systematic manner. So that issues related to observations are discussed in a, in a common platform, issues related to a user interface platform, in fact the issues of evaluating their usefulness and, and, and the benefit of, of, uh, of services can be done within that, that, that framework. So we are facilitating these uh, national frameworks and we've got some examples in a few countries where they're giving um, good re uh, results. But these certainly need to be uh, taken uh, into account considering the, the capabilities and the environments under which they, they are, they're implemented. And, and finally, um, what one, one last thing I'd like to uh, highlight is the fact that particularly when we talk about um, developing countries, one element that might facilitate implementation is having um, either action plans or development plans, which can be shared with all the actors, so that those who are interested in investing, those who are interested in supporting, have a clear idea of what are the activities that need to be carried out, but are also informed in terms of what is it that has been done and things that um, can be put um, into the future. So, finally, um, and this is also borrowing on the, on the, on the, on the, on the comments made earlier here in the, in the room. Perhaps as we put together this framework that would enable uh, the growth of the market uh, within uh, Europe, uh, one important thing that has to be done is clarifying roles and responsibilities, uh, which is a, a, a very sensitive and a critical element. As of now, there's no clarity where public ends, where uh, uh, private um, starts, and, and so we have to provide an enabling environment whereby even if that definition is not possible to start with, but we provide an enabling environment where discussion can take place and people can address those um, uh, things in an open and transparent manner. Thank you, Chair.